say thank you to anybody that came out to the work day yesterday. They did more things around here to help better the place, get better. One thing they did, and I actually got the help with, which I like, we opened up our new baptistry. If you look over here to your left in the corner, we have the new baptistry again. It's going to be it's going to be painted and stained coming up, but yeah, it's going to be a great thing to have. We'll be able to do the baptism right here and not have to travel anywhere. Also, uh, for middle school, high school kids, we got a back to school bash coming up this Friday night from 6:45 to 11. It's going to be fun. There's going to be guest speaker, adults. If you want to stop in and see what's going on, it'll probably be outside in the courtyard, but it'll be fun. We also ask that not to be in a hurry when you leave. You can sit out here in the cafe, have a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, water, and get to know somebody, maybe your new best friend, or if you have any problems, you can go to anybody with the orange lanyards. They're willing and ready to pray with you anytime. So let's say a prayer, and then we'll get to worshiping with this wonderful praise team. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being such a mighty and merciful God. And Lord, just let your words that are sung today and spoken touch our hearts the way that you want them to touch so that we can take those words and go out into this world and bring others to you that may not have that relationship with you. At least we can plant that seed and get things started. And Lord, just be with us. Keep us safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
comforting his disciples and he tells them do not let your hearts be troubled you believe in God believe also in me my father's house has many rooms if that were not so would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you
resuming that passage in John 14, and Jesus is comforting his disciples. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you always may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Sing this song with me, church. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. The ash was redeemed and they become my mom. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got lost. It happens once in a while. The song is very moving. And that passage of scripture put me there first. So, your love made a way to let mercy come in. Oh, you want to take it from the beginning? We take it from the beginning. Let's take it from the beginning. All right. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My open heart.
in Psalms 46, 10, God says, be still and know that I am God. Just reflecting on that this week, how often are we still? And, and if we're not still, how can we be communicating with him? Or how can he communicate with us because he's trying all the time? Just thinking about this crazy world we're in with all of this, the distractions, uh, you know, a zillion op options to watch on our computers or TVs or phones. Uh, traffic out there, busy, busy stores, all of this complication out there. And he just wants us to talk to him. But he also wants us to be talking to him because what, what about that person that you see at the store that he wants you to talk to? He wants you to be available instead of us just rushing around, rushing around in our, uh, you know, our crazy days. And it's, it's easy to uh, forget that he's, he's got a plan out there, but if we don't slow down, how are we, how are we ever going to accomplish that plan? And thinking, thinking to the Gospels, you know, the Gospel is the story of Jesus' uh, little over three years, uh, you know, in his ministry. And you see him doing a lot of things, uh, discipling, you know, the discipling, uh, he's healing people, he is leading uh, or dealing with the Pharisees. Uh, with, uh, with everything they're trying to do to him, but the one thing that I don't see in there is him rushing around doing it. He's just going about his day. He's got a plan, and how many times in there is he talking to God and and taking that time to be thinking, you know, to be thinking about that, to just slowing down. It's not about this big rush that we that we have to do, so that. Uh, we're not taking the time to do the things that he wants us to do. He asks all of us to believe in him and uh, asks us all to be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins so we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So we have him inside to talk to us and yet we just keep rushing around and letting let life get in between us and that relationship with him. Um, so in a, in a few minutes, or in a, not a few minutes, but in a moment here, I'm going to have the, the men come forward. But before they do, remember why we're doing this. We're, we're doing this to celebrate him. We, we're going to take the bread and the juice together as a family, but we're doing it to celebrate him. And so I'm going to uh, challenge you, not just here today, but especially right now, um, after the men pass out the emblems, uh, I'm going to have uh, all of us, just an extra 10, 15 seconds of time just to bow your heads and be talking to him. Please come forward, guys. <laughs>
Lord, we love you. And more importantly, we, we love that you love us. Uh, pray, pray that you just uh, surround us, surround us with your love. And I pray for uh, you pour your wisdom on all of us here that we slow down. Slow down. Take the time just to, to talk to you, to love on you, and to have our eyes open to those around us that you desire us to start a relationship with, to start a conversation with. We ask all of this in your precious name, Jesus. The bread, the body of Christ. And the juice, the blood of Christ. Well, good morning, Christ family. Good morning. It would be a shame to kind of miss that video as we move into the next series. But I tell you, Tim was talking about how he was bragging about how good looking Joseph was. I'm not sure I'm as good looking as well, any of those characters up there. But anyway, I hope you guys have had a fantastic week. You're hearing some noise over there. You guys hear now? What's going on over there? Are we being spied on? <laughs> kids from our kids church and they have been working really hard on their memory verse this month who would like to hear their memory okay you guys want to start okay i will be with you and i will bless you genesis 26 We are. What are you guys studying? We're studying Rahab, too. Well, awesome. Yeah. How cool is that that on the way home, parents, you can talk with your children about what we all studied today on the way home. How cool is that? And by the way, volunteers, I heard you say something about that, too. So, like, We're on mission for them. Go We're pick looking them out. for them. Let's go tag them in right now. So, see, when the kids do their memory verse at the end of the month, they get to pick from the treasure box, as do the volunteers. And there's some pretty cool things in the treasure box, I gotta say. Is that like the treasure box promised land? It's absolutely the treasure box promised land. Awesome. But we wanted to come show you our CFCC kids today, and they've been working really hard. So. That is so cool. Yeah.
to have a little bit more fun back there. I'm just anyway, we have a good time up here. We had band rock it this morning. They so. did. They did. All right, you guys want to say bye? Bye. bye. service missed out on? Okay, back to service here, I think, right? Any more surprises? All right. Where are my beach people at? Who, who, are, who loves to go to the beach? Quite a bit of you, right? There's something special about the beach, isn't it? I was reminded that a couple weeks ago, me and my wife and my daughter had a great time on the East Coast. We were able to go, just go to the beach and be a family. And you know, there's a lot of neat things about the beach, right? Nothing comes in the water with you, right? Cell phones stay on land. You can even leave your problems there if you want. TV, social media, like all that just stays and you can just kind of go be in the water. And it was really special as the three of us just kind of put our, let our hair down. Well, they did. And we just had a good time and we laughed, we giggled, we talked, we talked life and then just kind of let the waves be us around. There's something special about when the power of God's wave the blast your body, right? It tumbles you all over the place. And you look up and there's another one coming. It's, it's really easy to look out and see, wow, how small I actually am in the world, right? When you look at a, just a sea of water with that much power, and it's just so impossible for me to think that anything other than God made that. As you watch sunsets happen, they're just so beautiful. And the breeze blows and you can hear a palm tree in the background. And just the sun setting on you, only God pulls that off, right? I mean, it's definitely from God. <clears throat> There's something special about being at the beach for sure. But what happens every time you go to a beach with waves? You guys are probably all know what I'm getting ready to say, right? You take all your stuff down and you find a home base. You bring a couple chairs and a cooler and maybe an umbrella. You screw it in the ground. You're like, this is our home base. And then you get in the water. And then time happens. You start having fun. And before you know it, you guys know what I'm saying, right? You're over here. And you look up and you're like, where's our home base? <laughs> oh, it's way over here. I drifted. And right, so then you got to kind of make your way back to home base. And then maybe you're a little more careful about it. And you kind of check out home base a little more often. But can I tell you, that's a lot like sin, isn't it? We have a standard around here that we live by. And it's called this. And this is our structure. This is our standard. This is where our home base is. Anything outside of this is a lie. And see what happens with sin is you have a standard of how you live here according to God's word. And then the enemy comes along with a deceiving method, right? He doesn't just say, hey, I'm the enemy, here I am. He asks you to compromise. And then you compromise a little bit, right? And then the next compromise is just a little easier because the last one didn't really cause any pain. And then you compromise a little bit more. And then you know where you find yourself? Down the shore, aren't you? Compromise. You know what a thousand little compromises leaves you? Compromised. And this is how it is sometimes with sin. It just doesn't show up one day and all of a sudden you're caught in trouble. Chances are you're compromised. And you wash down the shore a little bit. But the beautiful thing about our God is He's always welcoming us back. Yes, we have consequences to sin and it causes problems in our lives. But God always takes us back. I don't know why He does, but He, he is God. And it's amazing how we have that God that, that you know, is always there with open arms. I, I was reminded of this story as we're getting ready to study our last character in the Hall of Faith. It's a woman by the name of Rahab. Rahab, um, let me just set the stage here. She has a profession that not every little girl wakes up thinking, I want to be like Rahab. Uh, Rahab was a prostitute. She's referred to it in the Bible. And I want to be very sensitive when I say this because human trafficking goes on in our world today. And it's a disgusting thing. It's an evil thing. I think there's a special answer to God that people that get involved in this have to answer one day. So I don't want to make jokes about it, but I will tell you, oftentimes I don't know why people get into this profession. Sometimes the money's good. Maybe they just had a rough childhood. Whatever the reasoning may be, this is where Rahab found herself. <clears throat> also, Rahab lived in a day and age where there was no government assistance. There was no welfare system. There was no food stamps. There was no help for a woman who did not have a man to provide for her. 
you see in this day and age, uh, the men went out and got jobs. The men went out and had cattle. The men worked. And if a woman did not have somebody to support her in this day, she was in trouble. If you wanted to eat, you better find a way to eat. If, especially with Rahab had a family depending on her. So maybe she was forced into this lifestyle out of necessity because of taking care of a family. However the case, it doesn't matter. She is being referred to as this. Maybe she made this decision and found herself washed away from her standards of where she wanted to be in life. I don't know. But we're studying the, the only woman mentioned in the Hall of Faith for what she did, at least in, in depth, is Rahab. And you might be thinking, wow, there's some powerful women in the Bible. The Ruths, the Esthers, right? There's a lot of women noted for their faith, but the Hebrew writer, through the inspiration of God, picks Rahab to mention in this Hall of Faith by name. And so we're going to study her today. Let's go to Hebrews 11. I will have the words up here for you to kind of set the stage for what she was being known, known for. And then we'll go back to Joshua and study her life and how we got there. But two, two entities are noted for faith. One is the Israelite people. The second one is Rahab. So Hebrews 11 verse 30 says this. By faith, you guys probably remember that phrase. We've been saying it for weeks and weeks now. By faith, the person noted for faith did something. Not said something. Not said I believe something and walked away. They did something with what they believed. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. We'll unpack that story in just a minute. And here we are with Rahab. By faith, now keep in mind, this is, the, this is written... A long time after Rahab lived, the Hebrew writer still says, by faith, the prostitute Rahab, still referred to by her occupation. Because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. You ever read something in scripture for like the 800th time and then God reveals something new to you on the 800th try? That happened to me this week. And it was involved that last sentence there. She was not killed with those who were disobedient. As we get to this story, you'll see that Rahab lived in a city called Jericho. And that means that this entire city was corrupt, was, were disobedient. Your Bible might say that they were unbelieving, which means she lived amongst a bunch of people who were disobedient to God, who didn't even believe, who acted corruptly. And so she was spared from an entire city. So when Israel goes in and destroys everything, you might think that's harsh. Or you might realize this sentence that spoke to me, which was, they're a corrupt bunch of people. And God is still God. And there's a mighty hand of God. That we, we, we talk about the merciful God that always welcomes us back. But there's still a mighty hand of God that does what he wants, when he wants, however he wants to. And he's not asking my opinion anytime soon on how he should run earth. All right? So let's go back to Joshua chapter 2, and we'll read this story. Um, Rahab lived in the city walls. Uh, of Jericho, uh, it's believed that the city walls of this city were so big, this, this city was going to be impenetrable, like nobody could get in. They were actually boastful about it. The walls were anywhere between 12 and 20 feet thick, which means people could live in the walls of the city Rahab did. So, catch you up real quick. We talked about Moses over the last couple of weeks. You guys know the story there if you've been around. Uh, God used Moses, a normal person with a speech problem, to lead an entire nation out of slavery in Egypt. They complained along the way. They kind of got used to living in slavery and bondage. And Tim did a great job talking about how, if we're not careful, we can get caught up in an addiction or a way of doing life and like it there. We like the problems it brings. And to come out of it is harder than staying in it, right? The Israelites, through God's help, come out of Egypt, they come across the Red Sea on dry land and complaining the whole way. And so God said, what I'll do is I'll build their faith. And we look at this as a, as a discipline action against Israel, and it kind of was, right? Remember, they had to wander for 40 years. But I believe it was more than just, hey, you're in trouble. I believe God was building their faith. He was setting up a next generation to get into this promised land. Uh, you see the older generation died off, including Moses, and, and God showed Moses what was to happen the promised land, but he was not allowed to enter it. But during that time, you guys would call if you read this, God fed them every single day. Food from the sky. <laughs> Food just shows up every day. Building their faith. Why not trust a guy that provides daily food for you 
Today we still give thanks before meals probably because of this, right? God provides for us. And so now they're on the verge of entering, and the rain's been passed to Joshua. He's now in charge of the Israelites. They've got a whole new crop of young believers, people with faith. And that's what they're noted for. So, <clears throat> chapter 2 of Joshua, verse 1 says this. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. Now you might be thinking, why would they enter that house? I mean, it certainly wasn't for their, uh, you know, what they're known for, right? It wasn't for their reputation. A couple things come to mind. Obviously, this she lived in the wall of the city, so maybe it was an easy way to get in and out. Uh, they wouldn't be in the center of town. By the way, if you're going to spy on a city, you wouldn't walk to town square, right? Say, don't worry about me. I'm the new guy, just taking some pictures around here with my cell phone. <laughs> Nothing to see here. Just going to put this on Instagram. Right? If you don't do it like that, they kind of snuck in and out of the city. And besides, a prostitute's house would probably have had a lot of visitors in and out. So they probably thought they could sneakily get in and out and nobody would see them. That doesn't work. Verse 2 goes like this. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house. Because they have come to spy out the whole land. Here's where the faith step comes into play. Rahab's got a couple choices. You see, she lives in a city where she's probably not popular. Probably not a lot of tea time with the other girls going on with her profession, the way she lives life. She may have found herself washed down a shore that she didn't think she'd be washed down. And so she's got a couple choices. Do I save myself uh, or, or do I put some faith in what I see happening? More on this here in just a second. Verse 4 says, But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. Verse 5, At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. And I don't know which way they went. And then she kind of tricks them a little bit, right? Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. Go after them. Go after them. You'll catch them. But there's where the faith shows up. She had hidden these guys on the roof of her house under some flax. And then she makes a bargain. Here's where it gets interesting. Here's where Rahab has seen the work of the Lord happening. In verse 8, she says, Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up to the roof and said to them, listen to this phrase, another one that really opened my eyes. I know that the Lord has given you this land. You see, they're living in a city where false gods, fake idols, all kinds of worship is going on that's not to the Lord and she knows that's capital L there I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you that phrase melting in fear is used a couple more times in regards to who Israel is but she saw the work of the Lord and everybody here is melting in fear because of you you guys ever, uh, you guys, anybody here have a phobia of any kind? Anybody scared of anything? I'm fearful of small spaces. I'm claustrophobic. Especially if I were to like be upside down or couldn't move my arms. Ugh, I melt in fear. Like that drives me crazy. Just the thought of it, I got goosebumps going right now. Does anybody have a phobia like of snakes or spiders? It's something that would cause a fear in you, right? And not, not, oh, I don't like spiders in the wall or fear. Like something that causes you actual anxiety. Uh, that's kind of what I see here, this whole town full of people, lots and lots of people melting in fear because they see what's happening. They see something coming, a whole millions of people heading their way, and they're nervous about it, right? Verse 10 says, we have heard, she goes on, how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites, east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. That, that Red Sea incident was 40 years ago. Word got out. It spread around. It had become known. You see, Rahab's not acting in faith because she just sees a bunch of people. She's seen the work of the Lord. Can I ask you, Christ family, do you see the work of the Lord happening in your life? Do you see it in this place with this body of people? What's not to believe? Why do we act so faithlessly sometimes? When you see what's happening, when I see the growth in this place, 
a bunch of people who started meeting in the woods out here under a tent has grown mightily, and I see the faith in you guys. I see what's happening. Why do I not want to be part of that? It makes me wonder why only Rahab wanted to be part of this. Why so many still doubt it as they're melting in fear. If I was melting in fear, caught in a small space, and I asked for help, and, you, and I saw that you had a way to help me, I'd be taking it, right? I don't know why this whole city's not saying, hey, guys, help us out here. Let's make a peace treaty or something. Let's talk. Let's figure out this whole problem between us. She saw what happened to Egypt uh, when, when they came out of the, to the Red Sea. And then verse 11 says this. When we heard of it, all this that's happened, our hearts once again melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. So listen to this. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and earth below. She gets it. She knows there's something different. I don't know God personally yet, but I know what he's doing. Can I ask you something? Thousands of years later, we can still say this same phrase. The God, our God, is still God in heaven above and earth below. And he's not getting off his, his pedestal anytime soon. He's not getting off his throne anytime soon. That God is still the God that's calling you back to home base as you drift down the shore. That can still be our God. This, it's called repentance, y'all, which means I turn away from my way of doing things. I don't like where I'm going. I've washed way too far down the shore, and I don't like where I'm at. God, please forgive me. That's not saying I'm sorry. I'm going to do it again tomorrow. That's please forgive me. I need to get back to home base. Verse 12 says this. Now then, she's still talking way up. Please swear to me by the Lord. Once again, she recognizes the Lord is the Lord of this, in this equation. Please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family. Because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign. That you will spare the lives of my father and my mother and my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them. And that you will save us from death. You notice she doesn't mention the husband there. Might explain why she's in the profession she's in. Maybe it was out of necessity. I got brothers and sisters and parents to feed here. I'll have to go down this down the shore I didn't want to be. Our lives for yours, in verse 14, they agree. Our lives for yours. Or excuse me, our lives for your lives. The man assured her, if you tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully. Or excuse me, when you don't tell what we are doing, we'll treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord, not if the Lord, when the Lord gives us this land. And make an agreement to hang a cord, a red cord out her window, and everyone else in the city will be destroyed. But this red cord saved her. When Israel came in, they saw this and that saved her life. You know, a couple thousand years later, y'all, we have a red cord available to you too. It's called the Holy Spirit of God. Go ahead and talk about this. When you surrender to him, when you are baptized into a relationship with Jesus Christ, you are sealed with a red cord that will save you on the day that God ends all this that we see. I don't know how much you love this life. I'm, I, I've been truly blessed. I don't have a lot of complaints, but I tell you, I'm getting to that stage in my life where I'm kind of over the, the temptations and the sicknesses and the sadness. And I'm way over death, y'all. I've seen way too, many, too much of it in the last couple of years. I am ready for my eternal home. I am ready to go. But here's the deal. I believe personally that God has not has sent his son back yet because he is in the middle of being patient with some of you washed down the shore. Someone in your world is still down the shore they're not happy with. And God is patiently waiting them out. To where they come to their senses at the prodigal son said, right? When he came to his senses, he rushed back home and dad came running to him. If you've read that story, it's a beautiful story in the book of Luke. Go check that out. That's your dad. That's your powerful God that makes a wave that can blast you all over the ocean. But still has a tenderness that says, come back to me, I'll run to you. That's the merciful father we have. You have that option available to you today. If you've not surrendered to the Lord, please make today the day. Get your red cord in order. When God Almighty comes back, you know what he's looking for when he ends this place? His Holy Spirit. Who are, who, who's got his Holy Spirit living inside of them? That's what it's all about. We go down to chapter 6. They make the agreement. And then they're getting ready to enter the promised land. And God has a talk with Joshua. Uh, after this, they cross the Jordan River on dry land. You guessed it. 
We talked about this during our Celebrate God series. We had our rocks and they built an altar there so they did not forget. But that's one more act of faith. That's one more way God was building their faith. Food every day. Then he parts another body of water. God is building their faith. We just have to step sometimes. We don't have to have all the faith figured out. We just got to know who holds it. And it's God. So God now has a talk with Joshua. It's in chapter 6. You've got your Bibles, verse 1. So now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went in and no one came out, right? Because they're fearful. Their hearts are melting with fear. In verse 2, the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. They're scared to death of you guys because of me. Now he has a conversation coming up with Joshua that you might think, Ugh, how am I going to pass this info along? Let's see what he says. Uh, I have delivered them into your hands along with its king and mark fighting men. Verse 3 says, March around the city once with all the armed men do this for six days. And Joshua might be scratching his head here if he wasn't such a man of faith thinking, how am I going to tell the guys this? Then verse 4 he says, have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with priests blowing the trumpets. In verse 5, when you hear them sound a long blast of the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout, then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up and everyone straight in. If you're Joshua, you might be thinking, how am I going to go tell all this? We're going to march around a city like every day. Then on day 7, we're going to march around. What are they going to be thinking inside Jericho? What are these nuts doing walking around our city out there? But God, right? So you see the word then in there happens. It says, after the trumpets of, and the whole army gives a loud shout, then the wall. Once again, God asks us to step in faith, and then he provides all the rest. When they crossed the Jordan, they had to put their feet in the water, and then God parted it. God wants your faith, and then watch him show up. This is what he did for Israel. This happens. They march around the city, they blow the horn, and everybody goes in, but God took the walls down. He just asked them to be faithful. Do as I tell you. There's probably a chance in your lives right now that God is asking you to be faithful in something, to obey him somewhere, and then he'll say, watch me show up. Watch me be God. That's what our God does. You know that God uh, provides this. They go in the city, is destroyed and done. If you're wondering what happens to, G to a girl by the name of Rahab, Verse 25, skip down there, says this. But Joshua spared, once again, Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged with her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And listen to this beautiful part. And she lives among the Israelites to this day based on an act of faith. But it wasn't blind faith. Rahab saw the writing on the wall, didn't she? She saw what was happening. She saw them crossing bodies of water. She saw what God was doing. Defeating kings that probably were uh, not very defeatable in those days. But God showed up. And by the way, if you're wondering about a past you have, and maybe you're still living in it, if you're washed down this shore a little bit, can I just encourage you to something? When you repent, you turn to the Lord, you have no idea what he will do. This young lady married a guy by the name of Salmon. I don't know if you know this. They had a child by the name of Boaz. Does that name start to sound more familiar? If not, a couple generations later, there's a guy by the name of David born in that bloodline. As in King David. Maybe that name sounds more, more familiar. A guy that wrote half the book of Psalms and more. And if that doesn't impress you, 27 generations later, there's a guy born by the name of Jesus Christ in that bloodline. So don't tell me God can't use your brokenness, your wash down the shore, your mistakes... Half the Bible is consistent of God using the weak to lead the strong. Half the Bible is consistent with, you just turn to me and watch what I'll do. And so Rahab, the prostitute, in her lineage, in her bloodline, we get Jesus Christ. How amazing is that? I think that's a beautiful story. Um, I bet you they don't call her that in heaven. I bet you that name is gone from her description. And whatever you've been des described as or called here on earth, it's just put in the rearview mirror where God has it. When you repent and turn to him, God no longer remembers that past. Watch what he can do with your future when you turn to him. 
I want to go back to Hebrews 11 and read just quickly. There, these words aren't on the screen, but I want to read quickly some of the other heroes that the Hebrew writer uh, didn't dive into, but he, he still mentions them. But it's powerful stuff here. Uh, verse 32 I'm starting with. He said, what more else should I tell you? Or should I say, I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouth of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released, so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. And then listen to this. The world was not worthy of them. Can I tell you, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit of God, if you've got your scarlet cord, this world is not worthy of you either. We are simply at work in it. God is with us to make disciples. It's our mission statement. Matthew 28, go and make disciples, right? Verse 39 says this. These were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised. You guys know, uh, based on your faith, we have purchased a piece of property right next door here. Do we have these visions of a family center being built there? A gym where kids, well, we just saw times a hundred, we play in dodgeball and they're throwing balls, and we adults can throw back at them and just, uh, and just talk about Jesus together. We have big plans for that over there, and we'll be seeking God's counsel this whole way. But let me tell you something. If I go to heaven before that happens, I'm still good with that. If I don't get to see the fruits of that labor, it's okay. There will be a day when Patrick Haas' name is never spoken anymore on earth. My prayer is that I've lived a life worthy enough to leave the fingerprints, though. My name doesn't need to be said as long as the name of Jesus is lifted high. But hopefully, by faith, I live a life that, that meant something for the next generation. We are studying a young lady thousands of years after she lived because of her faith. Think about that just for a minute. We finish that in verse 4. It says, They had not received what had been promised since God had planned something better. Something better for us so that only together with us they would be made perfect. These saints, these Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Noah, all these we've been studying will with us one day receive what's better. Except they probably are already tasting it. And he says the phrase, we will be made perfect. You know what sounds perfect to me? A face-to-face -face meeting with Jesus Christ. I'm looking forward to it one day. And this is what the Hebrew writer is saying. With them, one day we will worship God. We will sing like we did this morning for eternity. Right side by side with Moses and Abraham and Rahab. You notice I didn't say the prostitute. But with Rahab. I'm looking forward to that kind of eternity. So let me ask you this. In this series that's coming to an end here. What legacy do you want to leave? When that name of yours is no longer spoken here. When Christ Family Christian Church and this generation is, has moved on. What, what, do, what do you want to leave? What, what do you hope they say about us in a thousand years or a hundred years or whatever that looks like? I don't know about you, but I hope... It starts with the phrase, by faith. By faith, that bunch of believers went. By faith, they served. By faith, they worked. And by faith, they loved. By faith. Father, I'm so thankful for this day. This is the one you made for us today. We don't know if there's a tomorrow. So we will rejoice in this one. Father, I'm so glad you clean up our past. And we just turn back to you. Forgive me, Father, please, for, for washing down the shore too many times, getting caught in the ways of life, for compromising what I know to be true. And I ask you to do that same thing for everyone sitting in this place today, Father, because you are such a good, good Father with 
with you are of perfection, and I can't wait to be in perfection with you because of your sacrifice to me, not a single thing I've done. But God, until you are done being patient with someone else, I ask that you would just continue your patience with this generation, this body of believers, because you're such a good, good father. I can't wait to spend eternity singing with my brothers and sisters in this room to you. I hope in heaven I've got a beautiful voice. <laughs> thank you, God, for this day once again. Thank you for your trust in us to go make disciples. Father, there's a one plan to make disciples, and it's us, and there's no plan B. Because you have that much faith in us, how do we not put it back in you? Thank you, God, for these examples of faithful people who didn't just say, I believe in God and go act like the world. They did something with their faith, and you built it all along. God, thank you for building my faith in you. It's all because of you. I just want to go resend me, and I'll do that until the day I die. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for hearing this prayer. Amen. 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 Church, we're going to leave on, a, on an upbeat song this morning. But like Jeremy said, don't be in a rush. Get something to drink in a cafe. Visit with each other. I know we're blessed with another gorgeous day out there, but this time of fellowship is so priceless. We will have prayers. Counselors coming up to your left if you want to pray with them. If not, if you have a need, just pray with each other. You, you ready to sing to the king? Yeah. Yes. Here we go.